respectfully request the Sangha great virtues for the sake of this assembly and all living beings. Peace and a wonderful Dharma will to teach and guide us how can birth and death leave suffering and attain bliss and quickly realize non-birth. <clears throat> Cung thinh đại đức tặng thinh Vì thứ pháp hội cấp nhất thiết chúng sanh Tình chuyến diệu pháp luôn nhau đau ngã mồn Như há liệu Chân thoát tư ly cô đã là tốt chứng vô sân. How much is a blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one? Nam mô sa nam tho su che do ye ở la hơi đi sa miao san pu to xế. Nam mô ta đa tha tô ya đa ya a la ha de tam miu tam bồ đa to a. The unsurpassed, profound, subtle, and wonderful Dharma in a hundred thousand million eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I am able to see and hear, I will receive and maintain it. I vow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual principles. Wu shang 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 wei miao pha bai che wan che nan zao yu wo jin jian wan te shou chi yuan jie ru lai chan O Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Great Master Ching Liang, Great Master Shernihua, O monks and nuns and all good advisors of me, Tofo. Chu Fo Pu Sa, Ching Liang Ta Shi, Shi Fu Shang Ren, Gu Wei Chu Cha Ren, Gu Wei Shang Chu Shi, Mi Tofo. Chí Tượng Bồ Tát, kính thưa Thanh Lương Đại Sư và Thượng Kinh Hóa, quý Thầy Cô và quý vị Thiện Trí Thức Anh Như Đạo Phật. Hello everyone, uh, today is the 8th of July 2022. We are gathered here to continue discussing the prologue to the Avatamsaka Sutra as prepared by Great Master, Great Master Ching Liang. We are on his door number two. Mm, stores and teachings containing it. So he's doing, giving us an overview of what to expect from uh, the contents of this, uh, uh, the uh, biggest or the most important sutra in Mahayana at all. Uh, uh, very few monks and nuns are able to understand the sutra, let alone try to synthesize them or analyze them or dissect them the way that Master Ching Liang does. So it's... Uh, Mm, a nice treat to be able to learn as much as we can. Okay, we are on slide number 22. Um, teaching schools. Uh, their teaching schools are the regurgitate, uh, regurgitation of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, the Buddha taught a lot for during his 50 years stay here in, on our world, our Sao world. But he's gone now, and what happened is that he's no longer available. So his disciples, the Bodhisattvas, then continue his work. They came to our world and said, you know, I'm no Buddha, but I let me do something for you. I will uh, explain to you uh, from my perspective what he taught, because if you do so, you'll be able 
to penetrate the Buddhist teaching uh, in a quicker way than we were to do it by yourself. Mm. Thank you. Mm. And so these uh, bodhisattvas, uh, they founded these schools, and uh, many bodhisattvas came to our world, and the good ones are the ones who founded substantial schools uh, uh, that are still today, and uh, the schools are substantial because of the depth of their teachings, and also because of the kinds of disciples they produce through their schools. Okay? And the difficulties about these schools, uh, they, when they express their doctrines, is that they have to be enlightened. Because once you're enlightened, then you're able to uh, express this, uh, this something that cannot be expressed. Enlightenment is, is not something that can be expressed. It can be explained. Enlightenment is meant for you to experience it, okay? And so, um, so there's some difficulties in these schools. Uh, they verbalize this enlightenment, this state of the mind that uh, cannot be described. So the, the Buddhist jargon is, is a wordless. Uh, the wordless is a state. Mm, you, you states, uh, various states of your mind. There's no way to describe them to you uh, in, uh, in its entirety. For example, if you reach first stage ahadship, okay, the state right there of your mind is a very, short, a very special state of mind. And it's very difficult to describe it to you. Okay? And, uh, and so, therefore, therefore, uh, uh, these teaching schools, the first challenge is that they somehow have to verbalize these states for your reference. Uh, in particular, at the high levels, when you talk about real enlightenment, not about small enlightenment, you have to talk, but, but about the big enlightenment, the biggest enlightenment, the biggest level of wisdom you're capable of realizing yourself. Hmm. It is enlightenment where you can see your Buddha nature, you can see your true mind. When you're able to see your true mind, then you no longer uh, uh, need masks to protect yourself you know, from the elements. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, and uh, then then you're able not only uh, uh, protect yourself, you also see the real mark, okay? Uh, the externalists, for example, the Catholics or the uh, Christians and so forth, they keep on talking about the concept of the truth, you know? Uh, they get together, they study the Bibles, and they uh, want to learn about the truth. Uh, and their truth is worldly knowledge, okay? Because the truth can be expressed. The truth can be discussed. The truth can be described, okay? And that's why these people who keep on talking and describing about their truth, about their wisdom, about their understanding, uh, for example, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, typical trainings from India, and this is the Indian influence, where the Indians are high on debate of Buddhist principles. Okay, and that's from the Indian influence. When Master Xuanzang went from China to India to pick up the Mahayana scriptures, and before coming back, going back to China, he learned, he stuck around and learned from the Indians. And he went to Indian universities, learned from Indians' masters, okay? And part of their measurements of his understanding, his level of wisdom, is to debate the other masters. So he out-debated the other masters. 
That's when, and that's when he found, oh, well, there's no one else who can beat me, so I let me go back to China. The Indians are so boring. So he came back to China. Okay? He went back to China. So that's what happened. So, uh, and uh, I'm so glad that after he went back to China, the, China, the Chinese, the China people, the Chinese people, dropped, dropped their emphasis on debates. Okay? Uh, because debate is like children talking in the background. You can ignore it, okay? If you have any wisdom at all, whatever they're making a the noise in the background, it shouldn't bother you at all, don't you? Seriously, what kind of tempo is this? You see? And so that's why, uh, that's why uh, when you have real wisdom, you don't talk about it anymore. When you see, when you have true enlightened wisdom, you're able to see the real mark. That's something called the real mark or the absolute truth of the universe. When you see that, then you will also realize that there's no mark. What does no mark mean? No mark means that you cannot talk about it. You cannot describe it for others. So what's the point in debating? Think about it. Hmm? If you really understand something that cannot be described, why would you want to debate someone else to show, hey, I don't understand more about this than you? Hmm? You see? So that's why mm, the real mark has no mark whatsoever. If you understand the real mark, you don't talk about it. You don't argue about it. You don't demonstrate to people you understand it. Okay? So you see, that tells you the level of wisdom mm. of the Chinese has over the Indians, Chinese schools over the Indian schools. It's remarkable. Think about it. You know, somehow they went to a system, and the Chinese want a system where they say, you know, I imported it from the, the great country of India where the Buddha taught uh, Buddhism, and went to China, and somehow all the Indian practices disappeared. And they found it out the schools, much more advanced than the Indian schools. And in particular, uh, that only happens because they're able to see the real mark. And they are able to train very uh, wise, greatly, with the, the, the great, uh, great enlightenment uh, people, the monks and nuns and lay people who experience great enlightenment. Okay? So these, and these then, these, these uh, monks, and then in turn, founded the schools to systemize the, the learning process for us. Because if you give the whole, all of Mahayana, it's too difficult for you to enter. So that's why they start with school, you know. Uh, so that you use those uh, Dharma doors, those entry points, for them to gain access to the wisdom of Mahayana. Okay? So that's why they establish these teaching schools. Okay? Uh, so to explain to us, uh, to give us some clues as to what this Buddhist wisdom is about, okay? And furthermore, uh, it's not just explaining things to you or to uh, try to systemize the thing. The objective of all these schools mm, is to train you. The objective of this teaching is to help you become enlightened, is to help you attain the same level, uh, uh, obtain, develop the same level of wisdom as these patriarchs who founded these schools. Okay? And therein lies the objective of Buddhist schools, Buddhist teachings. Buddhist teachings is, first of all, to systemize uh, their, the language, the jargon, the approach in order to transform you 
from a confused nature to enlightened nature. Two is from a selfish person, hmm, greedy person, angry person, to enlightened person. Okay. And that's the purpose of Buddhism. Buddhism, okay, uh, again, has two parts. Number one, a systematic, uh, sy systematic knowledge, systematic system, a system of uh, knowledge, a description of our knowledge, uh, and then in order, much more importantly, uh, every single school is not beyond transforming uh, the changeless, uh, meaning that the transforming your stupid nature. It's, you're so stupid, it's virtually impossible to change you. Okay, and that's really, to me, that's what's fascinating about Buddhism. And the non-Buddhist says, you're so wonderful, you can do anything, you are so wonderful, you're so special. In Buddhism, we look at you and say, why are you so stupid? You could be so much better, but why are you so happy being so stupid? And if you keep on thinking so highly of yourself, it ain't going to change. And that's the dilemma in Buddhism. If we praise you, you think you're special. We, but we insult you, you run away. He said, I'm going to go to somewhere, another temple where they're nicer to me. They respect me. They welcome me. They make me feel special, like my spouse. My spouse makes me feel so special. Hmm? You see? So, uh, so uh, these schools, uh, are, they are successful because they're able to um, transform and help so many people with different types of levels potentials, if you will, okay? Mm. And this is the thing about Buddhism. You never, uh, you never look down upon others because we all have infinite potential, all of us. And these schools here systemize their, systematize their teachings and to make that point and to help so many people the varying degrees of level, the varying degrees of smarts, of education, of wealth, of height, some of them very short, okay, some of them are fairly tall, some of them are fat, some of them are very skinny, okay, some of them are, some are very smart, some are very stupid, okay, all different kinds of people, some are even women, I mean, uh, wonderful as women, okay, all those things, okay, there's no limits. And that's why, that's why you never look down upon others. You never think you're better. Because someone else who can be developed into something better than you are. Okay, uh, so, any questions about it? 22, 23, hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. the teaching school's uh, final objective is um, the uh, highest level, higher level of enlightenment for you. Enlightenment has many, many levels. This is what is unclear. When I learn Buddhism from Master Shenhua's temples, and they talk they don't even talk about enlightenment because these losers, they, you know, I can't bring you to enlightenment, so I'm not going to talk about it. Okay? Uh, enlightenment, so that's why when I learned Buddhism, it has all these misconceptions about enlightenment. You think like you practice, you become enlightened, and that's it, you're done. That's it, you can retire. You can put your feet up and retire. And they say, I made it. No. When you get to enlightenment, then you realize how stupid you are. And that's what's common to me when my disciples uh, got more enlightened. 
He said, what happened to me? I become more stupid than before. I said, oh yeah, welcome to our enlightened world. Okay, why is that? He said, for example, someone said recently, he said, uh, I don't remember a darn thing anymore. Huh? Uh, 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 I used to remember everything. I have used to be such a detailed person. I remember uh, 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 you know, the whole day schedule and what I need to do. Now I, I just like, oh, uh, my mind blanks out. Okay. So what happened to me? Am I regressing? I said, oh, yeah, you're regressing. Congratulations. You're regressing into the world of enlightenment. But nothing is a big deal anymore. And that is wisdom. Hmm? It's wisdom because uh, when you, you use remember everything, every single smallest details, okay, it's because uh, you're wasting your energy on unimportant stuff. Now you only remember things that say are important to you. What's important to you? Not a whole lot. You're free. You know, you shed so much baggage. You know, what did you shed? Anyone help me out? Anyone in line help me out? Huh? What did you shed? Huh? Uh, so many things. Uh, that, uh, that, that's, why, that's why you don't pay attention unless it's necessary. All right? Mm. So uh, when you become enlightened, then you realize that enlightenment, uh, uh, you become, you realize you have so much more you need to learn. Uh, you need to understand. You need to work harder. Okay? And furthermore, it's not something that you brag about it. You don't go around and say, you know, I will teach you something that is so wonderful. It turns you into numero uno, number one martial artist of the world. You know, you have all these powers, these spiritual powers that you are undefeated, that, that no one can touch you. You can do anything you want. Okay? And you can, you can be number one. Oh, what is in the martial arts? He said, you are number one martial artist of the world. I used to read a lot of martial arts uh, novels in my era. And the young people, they don't do that anymore. They have no, they have no goals in life. Okay, for me back then, it's so clear. You become number one martial artist of the world. Okay, never mind. Okay, that's ancient uh, history. Uh, so anyway, uh, so this enlightenment here is something uh, that uh, normal people or sentient beings cannot, can have any clues. So that's why you don't talk about it. Okay? Uh, but, these teaching schools, they quietly guide their followers, their students, you know, to get to those ultimate fruitions, okay? The higher level of fruitions. In Buddhism, Mahayana, we have a particular names, okay? The names are, if you should shoot for, again, this is the first time I talk about it because that's important. Mm. Uh, it, it, enlightenment is enlightenment. It actually, it has gradations. If you talk about enlightenment, you really want to have fun, really fun, a lot of fun. Uh, you have to get to the 10 ground bodhisattva. If you think you're so special right now, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's the whole point. When you get to 10 ground bodhisattva, you say, wow, now we're talking. Huh? Uh, so that's why, uh, that's why it's, not, it's not something that can be explained to you. It's something that these schools set up, these teachings, these procedures, these training programs, in order to bring you there for you to experience it. Okay? Uh, and uh, and at, that, at that level of 10 crown bodhisattva, now we are talking about you able to understand the Avatamsaka Sutra. This sutra we're discussing here, uh, you need to be at that level before you begin to understand what it's talking about. Hmm? 
Hmm. And the low levels cannot possibly understand it. Any questions about this? All right. So it's surprise, it's surprising to me that um, many uh, from before Master Xinhua came along, uh, very few Chinese uh, Dharma masters would dare uh, lecture on the Avatamsaka Sutra because they couldn't understand it. Then Master Shenhua opened his mouth and started explaining the sutra in 10 years, which is impossible task. Really impossible to explain in 10 years. Okay? Uh, impossible to, to understand it, let alone explain it in 10 years. And that's impossible. Anyway, he did it. And since then, a lot of monks nuns started uh, lecturing on the sutra. Okay? And uh, it's really nonsense. And this slide here tells you that you shouldn't even bother until you get the 10 ground bodhisattva because all you do is regurgitating. You're just repeating what others say. You don't understand what the sutra is about. That's okay. Uh, that's the way it is. So you basically are pleasurizing. Uh, you you copying from uh, the other the other uh, teachers, which is not a bad thing to do. But just don't claim you understand it. Okay, yeah. this is important for you to stop pretending you understand the Avatamsaka Sutra. It's better to say, I you know I think this. Uh, uh, I am using Master Ching Liang's uh, teaching, Master Shiva's teaching, okay, and so forth. All right. Hey, do that. <laughs> All right, 24. Uh, for the Tiantai school of Buddhism in, from China, is that founded in China, I believe? Yeah. Uh, uh, they're very erudite as a school. They systemized uh, and systematized and they categorize and classify a lot of Buddhist teaching. They are one of the more erudite schools in you know, Buddhism, Mahayana, you know, from China, where they, uh, they define them as four different types of teachings. Buddhism has, Buddhist teaching can be classified say, into four. Mm. Uh, number one is store teaching, number two is connective teaching, number three is separate teaching, number four is perfect teaching. Let me give you a special idea, some general idea. Store teaching refers to the Hinayana teaching. Okay, so it's a uh, it's, uh, 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 it's uh, the starting point, okay, if you will, of, uh, of Buddhist wisdom or human wisdom, okay, meaning that you learn this, uh, this uh, Buddhist teaching and the, in the Hinayana teaching will help you uh, uncover or fulfill or bring to fruition your fundamental wisdom, okay, uh, and number two, this is meaning you get to a state of egoless. You have no ego left when you learn the store teaching. Okay? And after that, you, the Buddha then talked about the connective teaching. Okay? The connective teaching is that he says, I taught you about the store teaching. However, it's only an expedient. It's not meant to be the final destination. Okay, uh, actually, it's paving the way. Uh, in the connective teaching is that I am t proclaiming to you that what I taught you before, the store teaching. Okay, uh, now I'm beginning to do the connective teaching to point to you that there's something else called separate teaching. So connective teaching is like bridging, preparing. You say, hey, do not be self-satisfied. It's a lot more going. And let me de demonstrate to you. It's called Vipulya period, okay? Where you, the, the Buddha said, you know, it's more. You see, I told you, 
the uh, sound here, the Agama teaching, the store teaching is not, is not complete. I'm going to teach you about uh, pointing you direction to something called separate teaching. Okay? This is, this is what separates men from boys. A woman from girls. Okay, uh, so there is definitely a big difference where separate teaching here means that um, you are talking about big enlightenment. Store teaching is small enlightenment. Separate teaching is big enlightenment. Connective teaching is paving the way for the two because how difficult it is to go from store to separate teaching. It so requires a lot of prep work, if you will. All right, and finally. Uh, a perfect teaching is when, uh, after you become enlightened, then you talk about actually the ultimate enlightenment is called perfect enlightenment okay, or Buddhahood. Separate is Bodhisattvahood. Perfect is Buddhahood. So you see, this is a progression of the teachings uh, by time period, by, by phases uh, that the Buddha did when he taught to the world. Okay? Xian Shou, on the other hand, uh, Xian Shou school is another school that categorizes and classifies the Buddhist teachings into, uh, into uh, five, not four, but five. It's just a small, this initial, final, sudden, and perfecto. Okay? And uh, again, this is how the uh, they, uh, they classified uh, to uh, the, the Buddha's uh, sermons. They said, first of all, there's a small teaching. So it's the same as store. And that's the in initial teaching. Mm. And then there's a final teaching. Okay? And then there's a sudden teaching. There's also perfect teaching. So, you know, so uh, uh, the Xian Shou is is uh, typically used to uh, analyze and classify the more complex teachings like the Avatamsaka Sutra. Okay? Avatamsaka Sutra can be broken into these five different types of teachings, if you will. Okay? So that's why this Avatamsaka Sutra is a complete teaching. Okay? It has everything from one to five types of teachings. All right, hmm. and uh, uh, and uh, so the various schools of uh, Buddhism in India and China are very scholarly. They they're very detailed. They uh, they very intellectual. They're fascinating. And the more you learn, the more wonderful you see, uh, you discover. Uh, the Buddhism is the Buddhist teaching very profound very stimulating intellectually, also very profound as well. Uh, and, and it's uh, uh, the original uh, schools in India and China are very scholarly, and this is what uh, used to be the case uh, from, from the ancients. Nowadays, uh, it's scholarly, but no real wisdom. Scholarly is with words only, with no real wisdom, uh, no real understanding. The emphasis is on the words nowadays rather than the understanding of the substance of the mind. Okay? But anyway, this is, this is to tell you that once you become enlightened, like these Chinese and Indian masters, you can go back and go deeper and delve deeper into these uh, schools, these teaching schools. And you see that you learn a lot more than Okay, so there's still a lot of work to do. Very useful, actually. Okay? Mm. But for us in this uh, Dharma ending age, uh, I feel that it to, should be separated in two different endeavors. Number one, you produce people to become enlightened. Number two, then these people can choose what they want to do with their lives. So, for example, they choose to advance, uh, enhance the death and the... And uh, the breath of Buddhism, then they're all welcome to go back and study these schools in great details 
or found their own schools. All right? Hmm. 25. Uh, now we go into the actual text proper uh, of the prologue written by Great Master Ching Liang. Okay. The second door, the stores and teaching in which it is contained, within, within which are two. Mm, this is actually the text of the prologue. Okay. 26. Uh, commentary. Yeah. Uh, commentary. And so this is second door that talks about, the first one talked about the causes and conditions and how the Avatamsaka Sutra was spoken, how it arose. Uh, and number two door, the second aspect of his prologue is that he, he would analyze the stores uh, uh, and the teaching which this Avatamsaka Sutra uh, has. Okay, so in particular, uh, on this door number two has two major aspects. 27. First, the stores in which it is contained. Afterwards, the teaching in which it is contained. In the former, there are also two. First, the stores, afterwards, in which it is contained. Uh, it's clear, right? <laughs> okay, uh, the first aspect uh, is uh, uh, the store uh, in which it's contained. Okay, the store meaning that uh, a, a, a container, uh, a storage, uh, and so this, uh, this, uh, what does it include in this particular, uh, the, these particular uh, storages in these particular containers? Uh, Twenty-nine. Now the first stores mean the three stores and the two stores, which are both called stores, since they store and contain. Okay, thirty commentary. Uh, first, we talk about stores. Stores are the general terms, whether we first take Buddhism, when we break them down to the first level of analysis is stores. How do you break down the Buddhist teaching too? Mm. And so he talked about uh, two stores uh, and, or three stores uh, because uh, these stores contain different types of things. And he'll be elaborate next. 31. Vasubandhu Sampari Grana Shastra Part 1 and Alamkara Part 4 both say Shi Qing She Lun Di Yi, Zhuang Yan Lun Di Si, Jie Yun. Okay, hmm. 32. Vasubandhu is the, an Indian, a famous Indian monk, Indian Dharma master. Vasubandhu, it can be translated from Sanskrit into Chinese, which means Tian uh, Qin, uh, Su Qin, okay? Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and so, which means heavily relative, and he is such a scholarly, very, very, uh, advanced scholar of Buddhist teachings, and he wrote a lot of shastras, a lot of uh, 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 analysis uh, about Buddhist teachings. And so, uh, so he's a, he wrote a few shastras, Sampari, Grana, and Alamkara, and so forth, and broke them down. He's very detailed, he's very erudite as a teacher, uh, as a scholar. 33. Of the three and of the two, why are they called stores? Okay, 
So when Vasubandhu wrote his uh, his uh, his uh, shastras, he referred to them as uh, yeah, the Buddhist teaching broken down into two stores or three stores. So he said, "Why are they call stores?" Okay. Uh, so it shows how scholarly Master Chigliang is. He's very well read. He read all those all those uh, shastras himself. The answer says, it is because they contain, that is, they contain all the meanings which need to be known. To contain means to include. Thirty-six. Mm. And so uh, the answer that the uh, great uh, the great Bodhisattva uh, gave in those shastras is that's because they contain. Mm. They contain, meaning they include, they also nurture. Okay, they include all the teachings. They include all the living beings that are supposed to be saved, and they can be nurtured. Okay, in order to grow. Children or people with limitations, people who are unrealized, they're young, uh, they're un, unformed, untrained, unstupid. Uh, they need to be nurtured, okay, in order for them to have a chance. Uh, uh, and uh, the stores also mean you draw near. Uh, you, uh, the, 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 the contain here re- refers to, refers, refers to draw near. You need to uh, get closer to the light, okay? You want to see clearer, you, need, you want to understand, um, you want to learn from the best, uh, you need to draw near them. You cannot, oh, 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 uh, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot, uh, 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 stay in your place and expect, uh, expect, uh, uh, if you don't draw near, you have to reinvent the wheel. Okay? Uh, she here also means, uh, uh, this uh, contain here also means to aid. Okay? When you draw near, then the aid uh, comes to you. Okay? Uh, unless you draw near, uh, it's very difficult for you to receive aid. Why aid? Aid here uh, refers to uh, the Actual, uh, the actual uh, coaching, the actual, uh, the actual uh, help uh, that you need to have. Okay? Uh, number five also acts as a substitute. Okay, um, meaning that sometimes uh, uh, you can you can use uh, uh, a substitute uh, in order to uh, to. Uh, make it happen. Number six, uh, to lead. Uh, okay, uh, people are stupid; they need to be led. Living beings are very confused. Sometimes you have to lead them by the nose, as if you lead a buffalo by a ring around the nose. Do they still do that? And we do that in Vietnam. Hmm? We lead uh, uh, stupid animals by the nose. Okay, so you have to lead. Yeah, you need uh, leadership, you provide leadership. Show his uh, to contain also to provide leadership, to, to lead. Number, f- number seven, to maintain. You need to maintain, help, need some help uh, in maintaining your current status. It's funny, I see that a lot of people drew near Mahayana, okay, drew near, for example, Master, Great Master Xinhua, who aided them, who... Uh, substituted as their father and mother, fed them, clothed them, you know, and cajoled them, led them to 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 uh, to, uh, to progress, to light, okay, uh, and to then uh, for some uh, personal reasons uh, they withdraw, they become they became disenchanted, and they withdrew, they ran away. And therefore, all the progress they made was unmaintained. They lost a lot of stuff, a lot of goodies. So uh, part of cultivation is to learn 
how to maintain, to sustain what you have. Okay? Mm. And to draw, meaning you, mm, the suction, you draw them nearer, so actually there is some magnetic attraction, okay, if you will. Uh, number nine is to elevate. Mm, elevate makes you a better person, loftier person. And number 10, grasp or attack. Uh, sometimes it's very forceful. You grab them by the collar and say, come here. Uh, okay? Attack is sometimes you have to whip them. Some of them like to be whipped. What do you And number 11, rectify like children. They need to be yelled and say, sit up. I remember, <laughs> I remember, you know, I used to, uh, at first I uh, was joining the, 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 the uh, order, Master Shane Hall's order of monks and nuns as a novice, and uh, we're supposed to sit, sleep, and I hated it. You know, when you work so hard all day at night, you still torture yourself, crossing your legs. When you cross your legs at night, you can't sleep. It's so uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Those of you who try, hey, Master Xin Jie, you still cross your legs? You still do? <laughs> That's inhuman. I, I am of the, of the belief that you only try the hardest thing once, and that's enough. <laughs> well, anyway, so I, I, for two years, I hated it. I hate it. Yeah. I hate I hate it. And, you know, I work so hard all day. I cultivate it all day at night. I have to cultivate at night. I mean, <laughs> isn't a, why can't a man get a break sometime? No, you're not supposed to get a break at night. So I, I would uh, cross my legs at first, and 10 minutes later, I fall asleep and I stretch my legs so that I, you know, the, 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 the sleep is deeper, if you will. You know what I'm talking about? You cross your legs, the, the sleep is very light. It's annoying. Okay? But when you stretch your legs, it's deeper and it's such more fun <laughs> you know, to sleep. Okay? So I would, would cross my, you know, stretch my legs. You know, I would, first I sit and then pretty soon I lean back and lean back and lean back and lean back and then pretty soon you know, the legs get lower and lower and lower. <laughs> and ah, oh, <laughs> heaven. Uh, uh, I was dreaming of heaven so happy. Until Master Shiha came along after a year and says, Get up! Cross your legs! I got up immediately. I mean, he was he is violent. <laughs> the only time he talked to me is like that. I don't get it. I, it's not like me, the way I talk to you is so gentle, so nice. <laughs> he was just, Get up! Cross your legs! And I was so terrified. I immediately got up in the middle of my pleasant dreams. I was dreaming of uh, being the emperor or something like that, uh, driving around my red cars and so forth. And then I got up, crossed my legs, and, and was able to do that the rest of, uh, of, the, e of, of the night. And since then, every single night, I was able to sit sleep. Okay? Uh, so, so to rectify is that the teacher has, uh, the point is that the teacher knows you're doing something wrong and they can't tell you yet. You know what I mean? So for two years, you waited and waited until, I don't know, something, something happened. And then he rectified whatever I did by frightening, it, frightening me to death. And that's part of rectifying. Okay, so uh, rectify is that he recognizes you're doing something wrong. It's not quite, uh, quite, but it's not quite that right time to tell you yet. Hmm? So that's why each person is different. So some of his advanced students, they could do sit sleep the first night. It took me two years to be able to sit sleep. And after that, I was so happy as, ah, I made it. Oh, I don't sit sleep anymore. <laughs> it's no more challenge. 
Uh, anyway, you see, so the show here, to contain here, actually is very elaborate. It's all aspects of containing of the teaching. So the Buddhist teaching uh, uh, is all that. Yeah, it has all those functions, if you will. 37. Speaking of the three stores, one, the sutra store, two, the Vinaya store, three, the Abhidharma store. 言三藏者一修多罗藏二皮奈耶藏三阿皮达摩藏 mm, 38 So you remember it says Buddhist, Buddhist teaching can be classified as two stores or three stores Let's talk about three stores Three stores actually are Sutra store, Vinaya store, and Abhidharma store Meaning it's about uh, uh, the major groups the group into groups of texts. Uh, the, the, the texts that speak about sutras. They speak about precepts and regulations, rules and regulations. Number three, shastras or or commentaries, uh, analysis of the Buddhist teaching. So far, so good. Hmm. So sutra texts are the words of the Buddhas. Okay, uh, about Buddhist principles. Number two, precepts and regulations talk about uh, our moralities, things that we should do or shouldn't do. And number three are shastras or, or commentaries from the enlightened disciples of the Buddha. 39. Within the first, to start with, the names will be explained, and afterwards the characteristics will be described. Okay, 40. So, within the first of the sutra store, uh, then he says, I will talk about the names, and afterwards I will talk about the characteristics. Hmm. So it's a very scholarly way of analyzing the Buddhist teaching. 41. Now the first, also called Sutra, Siu Dolo, and also and called Sutra, Sudalan, which are southern and northern variations of the Sanskrit sounds. Jing Chu Yi Ming Xiu Du Lu, Yi Ming Su Da Lan, Ci Jie Fan Yin Chu Xia. Okay. 42. You can tell on the back then. Okay, it says here for the first uh, part, it's called Sutra. Uh, the, the, the first door is called Sutra um, or Xiu Du Luo. Uh, some group, Chinese group, called Xiu Du Luo or uh, Su Da Lan, uh, uh, which are the southern and northern variations of Sanskrit sounds. Go ahead, you two. Is it a good idea for lay people to sit sleep? Is that a good idea for lay people to sit sleep? It depends. Uh, if you marry, you sit sleep, expect to get divorced. Okay, so this is one very subtle way to, earn, to uh, uh, prepare f for divorce. Uh -huh. So for, for, for married people, uh, honestly, I feel it's a bad idea to sit sleep unless uh, either you're a pure couple, or, okay, like Mahakashyapa and his uh, wife, uh, uh, or uh, so, uh, so it's reserved for people who, have, uh, uh, who can uh, have no such attachments, all right. So I. So the answer is uh, no. I don't recommend it. Uh, it's not necessary f to me for people to sit sleep for lay people in particular. Okay. Uh, uh, for Master Shenhua's uh, reason for teaching his disciples to sit sleep, I can look at them as two reasons. Look at them. Some of them I realize why they sit sleep. Was taught to sleep. Number one, uh, many of them 
have high sexual desires, uh, particular the uh, Caucasians, the white faces, uh, their makeup, their diet is too rich, and therefore you know you you especially you dieters uh, had a lot of uh, fats, have lots of uh, you know milk, uh, 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 cheese, and so forth. I remember this. Uh, pale face disciple, ex-disciple of mine, he says, he proudly says, I can do anything, I can eat anything, okay, but uh, uh, I can give up anything, but the one thing I will not give up is a slice of cheese every day. Hmm? His entire life, he says, I need a slice of cheese every day. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, when you eat rich uh, food like that, your uh, desire tend to be a little bit higher. Okay. And so to counterbalance it, you can, you can maintain your diet, but at night you can cross your legs. So you do sit sleeping. Okay. And uh, that's why Master Xinhua realized that uh, many of these uh, students, uh, his disciples, they still have a pretty rich diet, you know, uh, uh, bread and butter and that kind of thing, uh, it's pasta and uh, lots of milk and cheese and, and so forth. Um, so you can counterbalance it with just sleeping at night. Okay, so in general, just diet, but in general, uh, if you have high sexual desires, just sleeping at night will neutralize it make it more manageable. And the other uh, reason is that those of his disciples who, who sleep a lot in their entire career, in particular as disciples of Master Xinhua, I saw many monks and nuns who did that remarkably. Mm. It's very impressive. Mm. Mm. Uh, what I saw in them is that uh, they uh, are their their average is higher than those who don't sit sleep, meaning that mm, uh, when you sleep, you lose your samadhi, you lose your energy level, okay? And you have to rebuild it during the day. When you sit sleep, you can maintain it. Easier to maintain it. Okay, so that's a real advantage you cultivate as hard as the way they do. When you grind it out, for example, you go to our Chan Chi. You might want to consider sit sleeping because the Chan Chi um, is uh, a special uh, training period where you're supposed to drain yourself. Okay, and and uh, uh, and uh, at the same time, you're also supposed to maintain your level of chi, your level of energy. So remember, during the day you meditate, and at night you sleep, you lose it. And you have to build it up again next day. Okay, next day you build it up, okay, you maintain it, because you, <laughs> and then you sleep, and you lose it again. So that's why, uh, doing the cheese, doing a chan cheese in particular, you should consider sit sleeping. Okay, those are the major reasons why you uh, sit sleeping is a good thing. In particular, those of you who don't have guidance, who don't have don't have anyone to guide you in your spiritual practice, and therefore, the only option you have is to grind it out, like them people. And therefore, uh, sit sleeping is very useful for them. So in other words, I feel the Master Xuanhua, it's just a side commentary, Master Xuanhua prepared them for that, where uh, they, are, uh, they have to grind it out the entire career, okay? Because, uh, like the Hinayana people. Yes, Green, the lady with no ankle. <laughs> Thank you, Master. Um, I do have a question. So you have two screws in your ankle or three? Not yet. The surgery, haven't, uh, we haven't scheduled the surgery. They 
they pushed the bone back in place right now and with the cast, but uh, we're still waiting for surgery day. But you still need to have surgery, right? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. mm. Yeah. So, so how much longer you have to wait? I'm waiting for the paperwork. So hopefully in the next week or so. After the paperwork, you're just going to jump into the, you know, and they cut you up right away? <laughs> yeah. Really? So his paperwork is taking a long time? Yeah. And That's schedule. weird. Why is it taking you so long? They, uh, well, one... You are a nurse. You're a special person. How can they, you know, delay I'm, it? I'm no special person, Master. We still have to wait for uh, um, the primary physician to make sure that they connect to the surgeon. And then the surgeon have to find, uh, make sure insurance cover, and then they have to find the schedule that is uh, work for them. Oh, yes. Wow, it's so complicated. It's yes. just a broken ankle. What is such a big deal? <laughs> yes. Good Lord. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My question. Okay, good luck to you. Thank you, Master. I do have a question. So let's say during Chanchi, we are try our best and then we sit, sleep. Oh, yeah. But then what would happen when we get back to our real life and when we, uh, we You'll sleep? be happy camper. <laughs> you come back and say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> you don't know what they did to me at the temple. <laughs> Well, my, my uh, that's when you appreciate. I appreciate you more, honey. <laughs> I, I enjoy temple a lot. So my husband is, uh, uh, he, he's, he's very supportive. But my question is, what mm -hmm. happened to our cheese? Your cheese? When we get back to the laying back down to sleep. Would deplete and... Uh, and that's the whole thing. You see, yes. and that's a good question. I don't know how to explain it to you. Hmm. How about this? Uh, this is a, a common thing that uh, we did that was never explained to us. We would uh, take vacation time and go and torture ourselves for a few days, for a few weeks, or for a week or a few weeks. And then... We are very happy, we come back and we lose it very quickly within a, a few months. <laughs> Every year is like that. Huh? Two, three months, you lose it all. You know, you become so afflicted, even more than before. <laughs> yes. Isn't that right? Because then you say, seriously? It only lasts for two, three months after all this? So why do you have to go through this? You see the problem? And uh, so uh, it used to bother me a lot. A lot of people, uh, we used to complain to each other. You say, you know, we, we, we grind it out and we work so hard and then we lose it all after two, three months. That's it. So what for? What's the point? Uh, and no one could, could really answer us. Yeah? Yeah. My answer to you because you're stupid. <laughs> Who asked you? Huh? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> we give you three months of good life after, and you're still complaining because you're so ungrateful. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> yes, Green. Good Be Lord. more stupid, Master. No, <laughs> no, it's not that. It's the point here is that, is that for two or three months, uh, your life is changed. You go back and you see a chance to see your life, your prior life in different eyes, different light. Okay? And eventually you lose it because old habits die hard. Okay? Uh, so you reset your mind during the chi, training during the chi, and you come back and you all the habit energies build up back very quickly. Okay? And therefore, the lesson is that you realize that, remember when you came back, you first came back from a chi, you're healthier, you have more energy, you're happier, you're more pleasant, you're more patient with your children and so forth, and then you lose it all, okay? That should be, uh, you should get that as a message, that, uh, that you can be a better person, okay? Uh, and, and it takes work to be a better person, and that's how difficult life is. For us, 
when we make money, we uh, make a living, uh, it is uh, at the expense. We pay dearly to make money. Uh, we, we accrue a lot of afflictions. And therefore, it's important for us to occasionally break away from that and sort of like restore the balance. Because if you don't, you will sink. And that's what happened to, to regular people. I, I wanted to say this tomorrow, but since uh, you asked, uh, I have nothing to talk about tomorrow, damn. <laughs> okay, let me give me some time to recover first. I'm, I'm so afflicted now. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here's a difference between you and the people who don't cultivate. We both are overwhelmed. Life is overwhelming for all of us. I don't care who you are. You're president, you're rich, you're poor. It's all overwhelming. Okay? And mm, if you don't cultivate, you will drown. You will sink. You're not, you're not the same person as before. It gets worse. You become a worse. You're more angry. You're more greedy. And especially, you're sicker physically and mentally. You realize that? You cannot handle the pressure out of life. People blame me, you know, they blame it on the Republicans, the Democrats, and the Nazis, and the Russians, and so forth. No. Life is a culprit. Life has so much pressure. Life has so many temptations that we all become overwhelmed. Like it or not, you can deny it all you want, but life is overwhelming, okay? And to all of us, whether you're a bodhisattva or a mahasattva or an ahat and so forth, okay, they all get overwhelmed, okay? And, and ordinary people, but ordinary people are just victims. They cannot, they don't know what to do with it. They don't, don't have the skills to recover. Whereas the people who cultivate like us, you don't need to be a bodhisattva. You've proven yourself. You go to a cheat. You recover and you get better. And that's the message. I don't know why people didn't explain that to me. Okay? But uh, you have a chance to recover, build the skills to recover. Okay? And therefore, after two or three months, uh, you overwhelm again. And therefore, you should remind yourself, I need time to recover. I need to improve my skills so that I recover quicker. And that's the difference between people, ordinary people, and people who cultivate. When we cultivate, we have a chance to recover. Okay? Depending on your skill level, you require, you, when you're higher level skilled, then you recover a lot faster than lower levels. That's why the incentive is for you to improve. Okay? It doesn't matter how smart you are, how wise you are. You will be overwhelmed, and you have to learn to recover, period. And that's an essential life skill, I feel, that we need to give to our children. Train them to recover. It's not about making money. It's not about being successful. Okay? Uh, it's about going for the long haul. How are you going to recover when you're in trouble? If you don't know how to recover, all you are the rest of your life is your victim of life. That's all you are. Okay? For example, I will teach you some mantras that you are so wonderful, you can, you know, use a mantra to make a pencil move. Isn't that cool? Huh? Or you can see who you were. <laughs> you, know, you know, many of you were like birds. <laughs> 
<laughs> Isn't it cool to know who you were? Oh, now it makes sense. Now, why do I scratch like this? In a prior life, I was a monkey. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to know that? How does it help you cope with life? So to me, the main skills is for you to recover. When you're in trouble, knowledge, seeing those visions, you know, it doesn't help. It's not practical skills. Okay? Yeah. And, and, and so, so that's the foundation of Buddhist training is to help you build a samadhi so that when you go to these chills, these teas, you go... Well, you build up your strength, your stamina, so that you can take a beating. That's why it takes you two, three months after to lose it. You see, that's your stamina right there. I can take a beating for two, three months. Sound familiar? Before coming, I went crazy. Now I can last for two, three months. And then <laughs> I go crazy again. <laughs> yes, uh, black. I don't know, Master. For me, it's more like two, three weeks. Two, three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you see? Your skill level is low. What can I say? <laughs> or either your skill level is too low or your obstructions are so heavy. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so it actually... Uh, actually uh, you see that you're, you are, have a chance to stop being a victim, and actually as you get higher, uh, your recovery is so fast, so much faster. Now you're in control of your life. That is true, being in control of your life. Okay? Uh, I know a lot of people who have money, and they're so afflicted. They're so unhappy. The body is so sick. So what's the point? Hmm? Hmm. Or uh, many externalists, you know, I know some people who are such good yogis, practitioners, and uh, they, have, um, they recite, uh, have skills, they can, uh, and they can uh, float in the air, levitate, and you know, see things and stuff like that. Uh, in the end, they cannot uh, handle their own uh, uh, pressure their own stress. So all those skills are not practical. A real practical skill to me, fundamentally, is having enough samadhi power to last longer, and number two, recover quicker. That's all in samadhi and wisdom. And that's what you're learning in the cheese. And stop complaining, God, ungrateful people. They do it, you do it for free, we don't charge you money, you still complain. <laughs> ah, it's never easy. Okay, uh, so fast and good? Okay, so, uh, so now the funny thing here to me is that the sutra is a Sanskrit word, and they translate it from northern, southern uh, accents, like, so now it's siudolo or sudalan and so forth. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, that, that tells you that uh, the Chinese are so confused, they cannot make up their minds. Okay? Uh, 43. The ancients translated as Talia text, the wisdom shastra, in the wisdom shastra, it is called the text store. Gu yi wei qi jing, zhi lun, zhi zhong. Okay, this is when you are like a, of the uh, of your the um, the scholarly type. You say, "Oh wow, I know so much. I'm you know I'm glad I found this text where the master uh, uh, pointed out, uh, pointed out to me the origin of all this. Why it's called so forth? It's so impressive, you know, uh, uh, so forth. Mm. But." Mm. Uh, but uh, 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 so it says here, the ancient translated sutra as tallying text, uh, and, and the text store uh, in some wisdom shasta. Mm. So tallying text meaning the tally 
with the principles taught by the Buddha uh, and that to tally it with the substances uh, uh, of all Buddhas. Okay, that's one, one uh, uh, above tallying with the principle of substance of all Buddhas, below tallying with the potential condition of living beings. So it is, uh, it is uh, a uh, text that, uh, that tallies uh, between the words of wisdom and knowledge of the Buddha and that uh, with the state of living beings. Okay? Yeah. 45, tallying means tallying with principles and tallying with potentials. Text means stringing together, threading through, attracting, and teaching. So 46, to tally, meaning that you uh, make the connection and the, you, the use and the functions of or the teaching versus the beings who are being taught. Okay, that's what telling is. So the sutra, he says, here's the kind of text that contains the vision, the knowledge of the Buddhas that are very useful for living beings. They can change their lives. They can improve them, improve the quality of life. How is that? For telling text. Okay, Italian, uh, and text here is uh, the use of language, of the words, of a language, uh, to, uh, uh, to string those concepts together, okay? Uh, to string together, to oh, oh, mm to string together the meanings um, in order to uh, attract uh, uh, the living beings and, and threading through is that it, it, it holds it together, all the principles together, okay? Uh, this, these beautiful principles are held together by this sutra so that you see the connection of why the Buddha is teaching, teaching you about, let's say, the giving paramita, okay? And then, and then the uh, uh, patience paramita and so forth, they're held together for a reason, okay? Uh, so that's what sutras, uh, the, the text, uh, do, okay? Uh, 47, it is a text that tallies with principles and unites with potentials, receiving its name from its principal action. Mm, so he explains 48. He says the text here, the text that tallies uh, the Mahayana principles uh, and make them uh, applicable or connect them with the students, or the living beings, who are supposed to be the recipients of those teachings. Mm. And that's the major function of the sutras. You connect the words of wisdom of the Buddhas and, Bodhis, uh, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas uh, in order to aid and to transform living beings. Too far so good? Mm. So this is transformative. When you listen to sutras, for example, it's transforming your soul. Your soul becomes brighter, becomes happier. Your face is still so depressed, but your soul is so happy. <laughs> so far, so good? When you listen to my lecture, smile a little bit. He's, this guy is he <laughs> so depressing. Are you depressed by any chance? <laughs> anyway, yeah. 49. Italian text is a store being so explained from its containing function. 
Ah, you know, wonderful 50 commentary. He says, so, you know, you know, boys and girls, you know, don't forget, you know, Italian text, a sutra, it's just a store. Uh, so that it uh, it's, uh, has a containing, it contains, uh, its use is contained. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Furthermore, it is said that its proper translation is string. Since a string strings flowers together, text in the sense of warp is what holds the weft. Uh, I was preparing for this, uh, you know, months ago, and I said, oh, this is too much. <laughs> I can see text, I can see string, but Warp and weft? <laughs> Give me a break. Yes, go ahead, Black. Uh, just a comment that I don't know why this what? insists translating uh, to text. It's just sutra, right? Why, why they don't use sutra and use text? The translation. He has words. Huh? Words. words. Text is language. Uh, language. Okay, I don't understand. It's a use, this is the beauty of it. You use language to describe what the Buddha, uh, the Buddha's wisdom. Okay. It's so ingenious. It's so ingenious because it contains the Buddha's wisdom and therefore when you hear it, whether it's in original Sanskrit or Vietnamese or Korean, they all sound different, but they also point to, they all refer to this Buddha's wisdom, which has magical powers. Okay? Uh, so the Buddha, when he first spoke it in Sanskrit, in Hindi, whatever, okay, uh, it carries a special powers for the people who listen to it. Okay? And later, they transcribe it into Sanskrit. Okay? And even though it's not from the Buddha's mouth anymore, but the spirit is still there in the transcription. So that's why the Bodhisattvas, Manjushri, he says, okay, Bodhisattvas, let's get together and transcribe this thing here. So what happened is that the Bodhisattvas only can grasp so much from the original words of the Buddha. You see? So we lost, we, we lost quite a bit already transcribing into Sanskrit by the Bodhisattvas. Okay? On the same hand, on the other hand, Mahakashyapa also decided to transcribe it from the verbal recitation, what the Buddha said, into Pali. And again, the loss is even bigger. So if you recite, no, I'm serious, you, you, you don't take me serious, I'm that serious now. So if you recite, if you will, and this is my theory, please take it with a grain of salt. I have a lot of theories that don't make sense to me after you know, I've finished talking. So, mm, I hope no one noticed. Uh, but to me, if you read, let's say, the Agama store in Mahayana versus the Agama store in Pali, I assure you it's different benefits from you, different effects, because it's transcribed by the, Ma, the Buddhas and Mahasattvas versus by the Arhats. It's a filtering process. Does it make sense to you? Just like you know, I explain to you and you go home and, you, and your wife asks you, what did you learn today? And you say, oh, honey, to learn today, I learned so much. And you know, you lost at least 100%. Of, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> All you're telling your husband is that, oh, it's just the words. 
<laughs> sit sleeping, you don't get it. <laughs> you only can talk about sit sleeping. You don't know anything about text and tallying text and all these wonderful concepts. Okay? And that's what to me, this is why, this is why these, uh, these, uh, these, the text is very important. It has magical powers. I don't care. And this is what you, you go back and you don't try to explain it to your husband. You tell him, honey, when your mind is confused, when you are so stressed out, pick up a Buddhist sutra, uh, uh, you know, whether it's in Chinese, uh, uh, whether it's in Yana, Mahayana, read it and you see. You see the magical power. It restores your energy. You don't need to cross your legs. Seriously. Okay? This is one of those things because people don't want to cross their legs. But, but if you tell them to, when they're in trouble, they're tired, and they're, and they're depressed, read the sutra. It has magical powers. Uh, green. Master, I will thank you, Master. I have a funny story to share, because regarding my husband, he loved to read, and uh, I remember one day when I was at the temple, he came, and he took the uh, Six Patriot book, and he was fascinating with it. He read and he enjoyed reading it, and then Ling and Yui went by and said, "What is they doing?" And then. He, and then they saw what he read, and he said, oh, hurry up, we need to cultivate. If these cultivate, we all have to do it too. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the end of the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so, so that's why you don't, uh, you know, that's why the Buddhists revere sutras. They really, you know, before they open sutra, they just <laughs> they open. I, say, I, I used to say, oh, you Chinese are just so ceremonial. But now I understand uh, uh, that why they're so revered because it has magical powers. When you revere, when you disrespectful, it connects with you a lot more than otherwise. It really has magical powers, let me tell you. Hmm. So you read it or you recite it when you're in trouble, when you're depressed, or you're not feeling well, read it, you know. Hmm. Recite it. When you cannot solve a problem at work, I would read it. I would recite it. I'm serious. Okay? And let it happen. Okay? Questions or comments? We don't have time to finish today, so we come back to 52. Thank you, everyone. You're all very special. I know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>